Let's talk a little bit about competition. Now we tend to overemphasize the role of competition, not only in evolutionary biology, but across all biological spheres. It's so pretty. It's such a nice way to explain things. Oh, you know, those organisms are doing that because of competition. They look that way. They grow these structures. They have these adaptations because they're competing for resources. And that sounds really good in the nature videos, and, and it feels good because it feels like a nice, simple definition. A lot of times we're oversimplifying the situation. Competition doesn't always drive all of the changes. It doesn't always explain why we see what we see, especially when we're looking over time at changes within a species or within multiple different species. So our simple definition of competition is fighting over resources, whatever those resources may be, whether that's food or minerals like salt or water or space or the right to pass on your genes. Don't worry, we're going to get into sexual selection and really start to pick that apart because, um, well, when we get there, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Whatever the resource is, we have two or more individuals competing over that, that resource. Now, sometimes it's individuals within the same species. And that right there should make us go, well, that seems counterintuitive. If I am a bird of prey, say an eagle, and I have two eggs, and one of those eggs hatches first and gets more of the resources immediately because I'm feeding it so that chick starts to grow a little bit bigger and then the, the other egg hatches, why does that bigger chick start to pick on the younger chick and push it out of the, the nest, capturing all the resources for itself? From a parent's point of view, why do I care? I can take care of both of them. I can bring them enough food to get them to maturity. So why is this behavior still happening? I'll be honest with you, we, we don't have a lot of explanation as to why that behavior would persist because it doesn't seem to be for the benefit of the species. Clearly it's for the benefit of the individual. If I can push that sibling out of the nest, well, hallelujah, then I'm gonna be just great. But so frequently we're also looking at this good of the individual versus the good of the species. And from the parent's point of view, wouldn't you want to intervene and stop that from happening? So when we have that sort of within the same species comp competing and fighting over resources, that's intraspecific competition. When we have separate species coming in and competing over the same resource, that's interspecific competi competition. So uh, a classic resource that we see would be something like grass. A lot of organisms need to eat grass and if, if you have a beautiful meadow that has delicious nutritious grass you're going to have the deer coming in, you're going to have the bunny rabbits coming in, you're going to have lots of different species who are all like this is delicious I need to eat this and they're all going to start to fight and argue over that resource. On the lecture slides I have a beautiful picture of a little rodent creature and some starlings all fighting over the same uh, resource. And I, I love that because really sometimes it comes down to, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? Are you eating my resource? I love to watch nature videos. Um, whenever there's been a kill of some prey species, you uh, see some kind of vulture come in. You have some of the smaller creatures, whether that's crows or foxes or um, whatever the smaller kind of intermediate creatures intermediate creatures are, and then you have some of even the bigger creatures that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be scavengers. Things like here in the U.S., bald eagles and even wolves will come in and start to scavenge off of a carcass. And weirdly enough, even bunny rabbits. They have observed bunny rabbits coming in and chewing on carcasses. Anyways, the carcass is a resource. Lots of species are going to come in and fight for that resource. So when we start to look at competition, I think it is important to, to pay attention to a few types of competition and some of the observed behavior that's unusual. So one of the types of behavior that we will see is resource partitioning. And what I love about resource partitioning is it just, it's so beautiful. It's beautiful to watch it happen. It happens in our area every spring. So in our area, we've got forests and 
our forests have the great big trees, whether it's something like an oak tree or some of the larger uh, maples. And then we have this wonderful understory with lots of little shrubs. And then, you know, sometimes we have some open areas with some grasses. And what happens in the springtime is, and in the fall, is we get, in the springtime, we get the, the massive migration of birds from South America and Central America. They've been hanging out in the tropics all uh, during our winter. And so in our springtime, they all come rushing back. And the reason why they're rushing back up here is because everybody wants to make their babies up here. In our spring and summer, we've got lots of insects available. We've got lots of space for them to be able to have territories to raise their offspring and then the food's available for their offspring to uh, grow and beef up for their own migration. So it's, what's amazing is that we have lots of different species of warblers and they almost all travel together on the same day. The reason why I know this is I spent so many years uh, volunteering with Sam Bluff Bird Observatory, and it was fairly consistent. When we look at the data, plus or minus one week, everybody's migrating through our area at the same time. And what's, what's really remarkable is being in the woods when this migration is happening, being able to identify the species and see the resource partitioning happening. So what'll happen is you'll have some warbler species that while they're traveling through our area will only stay at the top of the canopy. They're going to be hunting for the insects up here. Now it's not that they couldn't come down here and it's not that they don't when we see them up north in their breeding ground or down south in their breeding ground. But while they're here with all the other warbler species, they're going to hang out up here in the top part of the canopy. Other species are going to be kind of here in the midsection eating all of their insects and other uh, warbler species like uh, the one that we call Butterbutt, the Myrtle Warbler, um, that one is going to be uh, down here on the, the ground foraging for insects. So what we see is when all of these different species are migrating through our area, they are partitioning the forest resource. Some are taking high, some are taking middle, and some are taking low. They're all eating insects, so they're all consuming the same food resource. But in the forest, they're going to, to divide it up among the different species. Now, it's not like they get together every year at the, you know, United Warbler Association meeting to decide who gets the top and who gets the middle and who's going to... No, they don't have these elaborate contracts and rules governing their behavior. They just do it. Now, we don't know if they can talk to each other or understand each other's chirps. It certainly doesn't seem like from an individual warbler's point of view, like there would be a benefit of taking the middle section when you could just be up here in the canopy. Like they aren't friends. It's not like they're trying to help the other species. Each individual acting for themselves, they shouldn't care. They should be fighting and beating each other up or traveling at different times. And yet we don't see that. So resource partitioning, is beautiful behavior among many different types of species where they're dividing up the resource, everybody's getting their needs met, everybody's maintaining a high level of fitness, and yet we don't seem to, to need that same set of behaviors and rules and, well, we don't know how they work it out. So it's, it's a beautiful behavior for sharing the resource, but it's relatively rare. That's why I've got some very specific examples in the lecture slides of the warblers and the uh, lizards because we don't find this happens very often. Uh, most of the time, organisms are, are going to be competing with each other with the goal of eating all of the resource and screw you, I don't care if you die and go locally extinct. So that brings me to this concept of com uh, competitive exclusion. And with competitive exclusion, we have a relationship between two or more species. And I'll just start with the example of two species because I think that helps us to understand the concept. And then we can apply that to uh, more nuanced or more complicated situations. So with competitive exclusion, we've got two species. If you grow those two species separate, they're going to proliferate, they're going to thrive, they're going to be very healthy. But if you grow those two species together, one species is going to outcompete the other, and the other one is going to go locally extinct. So competitive exclusion is, I think, what we more commonly associate 
with competition, which is, I'm going to get it all. I don't care what happens to you. My fitness is the only thing that matters. So when you grow them together, they're not friendly. One's going to outcompete out the other, and the other one is going to go locally extinct. It's going to, it's going to die. So our third um, type of phenomenon that we observe in association with competition is character displacement. Again, this is a relatively rare situation, but it's kind of beautiful when we see it. So with character displacement, what we see is we see two separate species, and if we grow them alone, if they're living all by themselves, then we're going to see a range in phenotypes. But as soon as you put those two, uh, two separate species together, the extremes of their phenotypes get selected for. And the reason why is because there's a little bit of overlap in the resources that they, that they consume. And so those two separate species that are can be competing for the same resource will force each other to start to develop different adaptations, to start to shift towards the extremes. We might see some directional selection in their uh, phenotype selection in order to avoid the competition. So this is why I love the example of the Galapagos finches. Because we have nice little islands, we've got clear-cut geographic boundaries, we've got one population of spite species, uh, what, excuse me, one species of finch growing only on one island. We have another species of finch living on a separate island so we can see them living separated and isolated from each other. We've got beautiful data on the range of their beak sizes so we know what the extreme phenotypes are in that and we know what the average should be. And then we've got an island where the two are living together. And where they're living together, we see that shift in the phenotype. We see that shifting towards the more extreme phenotypes in their populations. So it's this beautiful sort of culmination of not only uh, looking for directional selection, but also understanding the role of the relationship between species. Now, please be very careful when you are reading about organisms, when somebody's explaining to you what this organism likes to do, where they like to live, when you're watching nature videos, uh, planet Earth, or whatever it is. Please be very careful when somebody starts to use the concept of competition. Listen for nuance. Listen for whether they're oversimplifying the concept and the application to the organisms that you're viewing. And start to really question, could there be other things going on? Do we actually understand everything about this situation? We tend to rely on competition too much to explain the things that we are observing. There can be so much more going on. Our misconception about the role of competition has in the past prevented us from being able to see the relationships that are happening from understanding what is occurring. And so we really do need to stop and go, wait a minute, is it as simple as we think it is? So with this section of our um, unit, make sure that you understand the nuance and you understand those details because the details here and the nuance are important. As always, if you have questions, uh, please email me or stop into the Zoom uh, office hours.